you have your glass of Florida orange juice this morning? You may call her bricks and mortar, but a spirit lives inside her. A spirit that goes on before she or you and I. And we stand to say that legacy, a portrait of our history. For as we work to live in love, that spirit gives until we die. So let's say that grand old southern lady on the hill. Let's say that grand old southern lady on the hill. Let's say that grand old southern lady on the hill. We've served her spirit well and well we will. Ladies and gentlemen, Bobby White. Tremendous hand for Bobby. It's a great entertainer. I really find fun. We're going to go ahead and start with our tours now, and uh, Rachel and Andrew will be available to talk with you anytime during the evening. And again, thank you all for being here and welcome, and please enjoy it and help us to save our capital. Towards the end of its life as a fully functioning state capitol building, it was regarded as the ugly doormat of the state of Florida. In the late 1960s, the governor and the cabinet approved the appropriations needed to demolish the site or to renovate it, as well as construct a new modern capitol complex. Once again, a debate raged in the House about moving the capital to Orlando. This call was led by South Florida Democrats, many of whom were far more liberal and progressive in their outlook than the traditional conservative panhandle Democrats that had for so long dominated the legislature. These veterans so against to any manner of change, had long dug in their heels and declined to rebuild or modernize the structure. With the new massively reapportioned districts in the late 1960s, the South Floridian delegation now had the votes to determine the fate of the capital, and they gave the legislature an ultimatum. Restore, modernize, or demolish. Do it soon, or we're moving the capital somewhere else. Not wanting to lose their base of operations, the panhandlers finally complied and decided to build a new capital complex. With its preservation record checkered at best, many activists and historians were worried that they would just merely demolish the old historic capital. One South Floridian representative said that it was as barren of anything comfortable as the great desert was of water. The fire marshal of Tallahassee said that if it was in his jurisdiction, he would condemn the whole entire Capitol complex. Representative Walter C. Young said that there was nothing in it that could convey the historical importance of its day-to-day -day operations. Future Governor Buddy McKay would talk about all of his frequent office spaces as though they were nothing more than a cramped cabinet or utility closet. Oftentimes legislators would have to share two or three members for an office space. 
pages would frequently have to run the legislators from one end of the building to the other. To make matters worse, once in that committee room, you would frequently have one or two committees going on simultaneously in the same space. John Williams, Reuben Askew's future lieutenant governor, said that the entire structure had stucco falling down from the ceilings, plaster in places where nails were frequently hammered in. Behind the curtain are touch boards, which by, in which the voting is recorded. Above the wall are the public galleries, which, unlike the House of Representatives, I'm hopefully being able to get a lump sum appropriation uh, Mr. Stone and the joint venture, which is Reynolds Smith and Hill of Jacksonville, indicated that then gave them uh, the flexibility that they didn't first enjoy when they indicated that the tower should be behind this intersection of the Capitol. But by virtue of being able to build it at once, they were then able to move the center section in and make it an integral part of the Capitol, which they indicate to us not only is better functionally, aesthetically, but also, we can build it uh, uh, more inexpensively than we would have had it been the separate building. It gives you the benefit of having a separate facility, but yet locked in for purposes of communication with the branches. And I really think that, uh, that we will have a, a beautiful capital. I think it'll be one that'll be a credit to the state, and I hope the legislature passes the money for us to be able to build it and start on it this year. For years, the territorial governments would meet biannually between Pensacola and St. Augustine. Yet the urgency for them to find a permanent capital became all the more urgent due to this arduous annual journey between these two rotating capitals and the numerous members of the territorial legislature that would die in transit. It was decided that surveyors would meet at the middle ground between Pensacola and St. Augustine and find an adequate spot to build the capital. They found it in an ancient piece of Indian ground and it was called Tallahassee. In the 1830s, the U.S. Congress, knowing that Florida would soon become a state, appropriated $20,000 the equivalent of half a million dollars today for them to construct a capital building. For years, the construction was held up due to a lack of funds, yet eventually a humble structure was erected in Tallahassee. For the next few decades, this structure served its purpose admirably. It was here that the state decided to secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. But by the 1890s, the structure was in disarray, due mainly to the fact that the state had experienced its first great boom in population size. It was determined that an enlargement, a renovation of the capital would have to be done. But before that was done, the first whiff of moving the capital began to take place. It was put up to a vote would Tallahassee remain the capital, or would Jacksonville or St. Augustine be used as the permanent base of the state government? In a landslide, Tallahassee was determined to remain the permanent location for the capital. So it was renovated. Two wings were added, and this was when the building got its copper dome. If you visit the historic capital today, you might be forgiven for thinking that this was the actual capital that was used up until the 1970s. This, in actuality, is a reproduction of what the capital would have looked like in 1902 when the legislature walked in on a perfectly new, renovated, and enlarged structure. The ground floor was reserved mostly for the executive branch and for the Supreme Court. It housed the governor's suite in the comptroller's office, as well as the cabinet room. The second floor was reserved for the legislature and the Senate. It was here that they determined the fate of the Everglades, and where dries and wets battled often over prohibition. It was also in this house chamber 
that a bird's nest was found by janitors, and the body voted as to whether or not it would be removed. It didn't pass. The Equal Rights Amendment simply states, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, and would authorize the Congress and the states to enforce the amendment by appropriate legislation. That sounds simple enough, doesn't it? But those few words have divided more women's groups, more political groups, more families, and almost any issue since the Vietnam War. You know, a lot of people think that the ERA issue is a relatively new one, when in actuality it's been going on almost 50 years. Resolutions proposing the Equal Rights Amendment have been introduced in every Congress since 1923. As you know, emotional issues have a way of distorting the facts. And I have felt for some time that this was happening in the busing issue, and that the truth about busing in Florida would be an enlightening contrast to what we've been told so often by so many for so long. Over the past 20 years, the average number of students bused in Florida was 32 out of every 100 in average daily attendance. This study shows that we achieved more than 90% desegregation in Florida last year while transporting 35 students out of 100, only three more than the average. And indications are that the percentage of students being bused in Florida is going down again this year. The parade today is a giant spectacle of sights and sounds. From all over the state, bands, floats, and pretty girls come to salute the new governor and the first lady.
Barron was Senate president during the 1975 and 1976 sessions. One of his most ruthless displays of power came during the 1975 session. The Senate refused to confirm the governor's appointment of O.J. Keller as head of the Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services. The result was all-out war between Barron and Governor Reuben Askew. Before the dust settled, Barron's friend, Lou Brantley of Jacksonville, had overthrown Askew's ally, Senator Bob Saunders of Gainesville, as the next Senate president. I have not been involved in the lobbying of this president's race, but the governor of Florida last night, through his various lieutenants, way past midnight, was calling, threatening, threatening to take people's jobs, making terrible threats against the membership of this Senate, threatening to take one senator's son's job if they didn't go one way or the other in this Senate race. I take the strongest kind of exception to that. This is the Senate of Florida, and I'm proud of it. And I say, let the word go forth from this day forward in the, in the words of Jack Kennedy that the governor of Florida will not run the Florida Senate. And I urge him to stay the hell out of our business up here. I think this is the Senate of the state of Florida, not the Senate of the 10 soldiers of the governor. I'm not certain the governor knows anything about it. I am. Well, <laughs> well if he does, I agree with the president. He ought to get his nose out of the Senate's business. Uh, in regard to the remarks of yesterday, which I thought were inappropriate, intemperate, and uh, frankly, uh, disappointing. But I don't intend to let anyone, including Mr. Barron, intimidate me from doing anything that I think I must do for the people of Florida. That's why I was elected. When you get to the point in the, in the legislature, you know, to where you have absolute control over a whole legislative body, and if ever there was an area that cried out for reform, you know, in the efforts of the legislative branch to diffuse the executive authority, isn't it time now that the legislature reform itself and start having a committee on committees so one person cannot call somebody up and say, okay, if you don't vote for me like I want you to do, you're going to lose your committee chairmanships. You're going to lose your legislation. And what that does, in effect, is that disenfranchises all the voters in that person's area. Hey, well, that's now, when you talk about arm twisting, <coughs> I've never seen more blatant arm twisting on behalf of anyone in my 17 years of government. The Capitol complex expands. New government buildings spiral up. Then, it just seems we outgrew. Instead of enlarging the old Capitol, a new one was built. And contemporary values are written again in the language of architecture. The latest chapter a diary written in days and events in brick and marble, a place that has reflected the culture and values of Floridians for well over a hundred years. That history is culminating with the last legislative session to meet in these chambers. Recently, I took a trip to the new, modern Florida Capitol building. The legislature was in session and I wanted to see them in action. It was only about 11 o'clock in the morning, and when I entered, I found the place empty. I asked one of the pages what happened, and they said that the body adjourned for the day because there was something wrong with the chamber's sound system. I immediately thought about a similar day in the 1970s where that body debated on an issue until one o'clock in the morning. There was a rule at the time that the body had to adjourn by midnight, and the debate was so heated that they simply stopped the clock at midnight and continued until almost two o'clock in the morning. When I told Ralph Turlington, the legendary former speaker of the Florida House, what had happened, he just laughed and said, Ah, hell, we would have just started shouting. <laughs>